Welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's, a weekly podcast from St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Orlando that invites you to go deeper with scripture, to learn God's story, so that together we can live, love, and lead a life following Jesus to awaken disciples and reveal the kingdom. This week on Your Week with St. Luke's, we are joined again by Dr. Ryan Bonfilio from the Candler Foundry, and we are continuing in our series, Resolute in Purpose. Last week, we were introduced to Daniel, and we got to hear about how he found himself in service to the king, somewhere he had not necessarily expected to go. But now that he's there, he is given opportunities he hadn't expected either. And so this week, we'll explore chapters two and four of the book of Daniel with particular focus on chapter two, where Daniel's gift of interpreting dreams becomes one of his greatest assets. And in worship this week, we will be faced with the question for ourselves. What will we do in our own contexts when we have opportunities to use our gifts because of how we have been resolute in our values? So let's join Dr. Bonfilio in Daniel chapter 2. Have you ever had a dream that left you wondering, what was that all about? Maybe some of the figures in the dream were hard to identify. Or maybe the events and circumstances were all out of place. Maybe you were left wondering where that dream came from. Was it because of the late night burrito you ate just before going to bed? Or could it somehow be a message from your subconscious? Dreams and their interpretation are at the heart of Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 4. And both of these texts are the focus of this second lesson in our series on the book of Daniel. In both of these chapters, it is the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, who is terrified by a strange dream. And in both cases, the king is left looking for help interpreting what those dreams mean. What you need to realize going into these stories is that in the ancient world, there were whole categories of people whose job it was to interpret dreams. The biblical texts refer to them as magicians and enchanters, which might lead you to Picture a tarot card reader at the local fair or even Professor Trelawney from the Harry Potter series. But that's not exactly what the author has in mind. You see, in the ancient world, dream interpreters were something closer to public intellectuals or even political advisors. They believed that through dreams, humans and especially kings received messages from the gods. Now, the average person wouldn't know what to make of the dreams. And so these dream interpreters had these massive books. You can think of them as encyclopedias that laid out various elements of a dream and what they meant. So if a person dreams about, say, a thin cow, it means X. And when a person dreams about a drought, it means Y. The drama of Daniel 2 and 4 hinges around the fact that none of the official dream interpreters in Babylonia are able to make sense of the king's dreams. But Daniel, this young Israelite, is. Let's take a closer look at what happens in each case. I'll start with Daniel 4, and then we'll work backwards to Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel 4, the king dreams about a huge tree with branches stretching up to the heavens. Its foliage is beautiful and its fruit abundant. Then, suddenly, a holy watcher, which is another word for an angel, comes down and declares that this extraordinary tree is about to be cut down and a band of iron is to be placed on its stump. Then, right in the middle of verse 15, the dream ceases being about a tree and is now about a human who is driven out into the fields to wander about as a wild animal for seven years. It's all really bizarre, and one can hardly fault the dream interpreters for being confused. At this point, Daniel comes in, and he provides the right interpretation. The tree, as Daniel explains, is the king, and the tree's splendor and might symbolizes the king's powerful empire and his rule. But just like the tree, this king will be cut down to size, and he, like the wild beast in the dream, will be driven away from his palace and place of power for seven years. Only then will he be restored. As it turns out, none of what is described in the dream actually ever happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. We know Nebuchadnezzar was a real Babylonian king who ruled from 
605 to 562 BCE. But he never loses power, and the, as the dream describes, and he never is driven out from his capital city. However, something close to what the dream describes does happen to a later Babylonian king, a guy named Nabonidus. It is during his reign that the Persians come along, they defeat the mighty Babylonian Empire. The tree, as it were, is cut down and stripped. And further, there was this period during Nabonidus' reign in which he, somewhat mysteriously, leaves the capital city and relocates to a remote part of the empire, much like the wild beast in the dream. And while there, he is apparently afflicted with an illness for seven years before returning to the city Babylon, where he is reinstated as a king. So what do we make of this? Has the author of the book Daniel confused Nebuchadnezzar for Nabonidus? Maybe so. The book of Daniel would have been written almost 400 years after the time of the Babylonian. So it's possible that the author knew the story of a Babylonian king who was cut down to size and left the capital city, but mistakenly attached that story to Nebuchadnezzar rather than to Nabonidus. All of that is possible. But here's another way you might think about the historical confusion in this text. Maybe from the very start, the dream is not specifically about what will happen to Nebuchadnezzar or Nabonidus, but rather it's about what will ultimately happen to all kings, whether Babylonian or otherwise. Eventually, every empire, even those as powerful as the Babylonians or the Greeks or the Romans, will fall. Eventually, even a period as traumatic as the exile will come to a close. For Israelites living in exile or for any other people living in the face of justice and oppression, this is profoundly good news. Daniel 4 is a commentary about how God, Israel's true and ultimate king, is more powerful than any king the Babylonians could ever put forth. And amazingly, at the end of chapter 4, even the Babylonian king recognizes this. In verse 34, the king lifts up his voice and praises God, declaring that his sovereignty is an everlasting sovereignty and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. If we imagine these words coming from Nabonidus, there is a great irony. For the name Nabonidus in Akkadian means the Babylonian god Nabu is praiseworthy. But of course, in Daniel 4, it is Yahweh alone who is praised. Now, further, we might notice connections to other places in the Bible where we find tree imagery, just like in the dream. Consider Psalm 1. In this prayer, the tree becomes a symbol of a faithful disciple who bears abundant fruit, while the tree of the unrighteous, much like the tree in the dream in Daniel 4, withers and fades. Or we might think of Jesus' parable of the soil in Matthew 13, where it is only the seed that is planted in rich soil that takes root and flourishes, while the seed that falls in the rocky place or among thorns never matures. Or, turning to the very end of the Bible, we might call to mind the tree described in Revelation 22, which is found in the new earth and whose leaves are said to be for the healing of the nation. While there is no hope for the Babylonian king and his empire of oppression, God has given us a new type of tree that stands secure, a symbol of hope and reconciliation for our world. Now, let's turn back to the dream in Daniel 2. This chapter has many similarities with Daniel 4. The king is a strange dream about kingdoms rising and falling. The professional diviners can't make sense of it, and then Daniel comes along and offers a proper interpretation. But there's an interesting twist along the way. You see, the king decrees from the start that anyone who can't interpret the dream will be put to death. And to make matters worse, the king refuses to even reveal the content of the dream to his interpreters. The diviners have to provide interpretation without ever knowing what the dream was about. This would be like me asking one of my Candler students to provide a proper interpretation of a biblical text without telling them which text I have in mind. If I were to do this, believe me, my students would protest passionately. And so do the, the professional dreamer, dream interpreters in Daniel 2. This only enrages the king further. 
He is about to have all of them put to death when Daniel enters on the scene. He asks for a shot at the task and prays to God to reveal to him the dream and its interpretation. And sure enough, God provides. As the story goes, God sends Daniel a dream that discloses the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and its meaning. The dream in Daniel 2 is even more complicated and bizarre than what we find in Daniel 4. In a nutshell, the king sees a large statue made of four different types of metal gold, silver, bronze, and iron. The statue ultimately is smashed by a large stone, and then this stone grows into an enormous mountain. The interpretation given by Daniel is that the four parts of the statue represent four sequential kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, and then finally the Greeks. This reflects the historical sequence of nations that dominate the ancient world from around 550 BCE all the way up to 150 BCE. The idea that history can be represented as four sequential kingdoms is not an invention of the book of Daniel. This schema, in fact, is widely attested outside of the Bible. It's found in Roman, Persian, and Greek sources going all the way back to the 8th century BCE, long before the book of Daniel was written. It seems to be a somewhat universal way of acknowledging that kingdoms rise and fall no kingdom is permanent. But what about that fifth kingdom? Scholars debate about whether it is to be understood as an actual earthly kingdom, like Israel restored after the exile, or rather if it is something like the kingdom of God, which is not a geopolitical entity, but rather a future spiritual reality. In either case, the point of the dream is that this last kingdom is everlasting and of a completely different sort than the kingdoms that come before it. Once all of this drama plays out, the chapter ends with Daniel being promoted and once again the Babylonian king praising God. Daniel 2 shares striking similarities with another story in scripture, the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 to 50. There, Pharaoh, another foreign king, had a dream and needed interpreters to help him understand it. And as in our text, the king's official interpreters failed to provide an answer. Joseph, an Israelite living in the court of a foreign king, just like Daniel, proves to be the more reliable reader of the dream. And in the end, both Joseph and Daniel attribute their success not to their own skill, but to God's intervention. And both are rewarded with positions of great prominence in a foreign land. Daniel is a type of Joseph 2.0. Both Daniel and Joseph are meant to represent what it looks like to exert one's agency and influence when living in a foreign land. As Israelites in the court of a foreign king, Joseph and Daniel would have faced significant constraint. They would not have been able to express their faith freely. They would not have been able to choose their own career. Their responsibilities in the foreign court would have limited who they had contact with what they spent their time on, even what language they would have spoken. Many ancient Israelite readers, and maybe many of you today, can empathize with the reality of constraint in your life. There are things we hope for and long for, but given the conditions of the world, they seem out of reach. Maybe your constraints are financial, or maybe they have to do with age or ability, or maybe they have something to do with your upbringing or identity. Constraints are incredibly hard. It has been said that despair is not so much a product of how bad things are now, but the inability to imagine that things will one day be different. The stories of Daniel and Joseph are both about individuals who recover agency in the midst of significant constraints. They both seize upon an unexpected opportunity. Neither set out to be dream interpreters. This wasn't the opportunity they were looking for, but remarkably, when the moment comes, they trust that God will be with them, and they lean in to this risky chance. There is real risk in doing so. Remember in Daniel 2, the king threatens to kill anyone who gets the interpretation wrong. But there's always a risk when it comes to exerting our agency 
the risk that we won't have all the answers, the risk that our decisions won't be followed or liked, the risk that comes along with not knowing what lies ahead. Daniel and Joseph step forward and embrace the opportunity given to them. The result of their actions is that both are promoted to a position of great influence. But what's remarkable is how they use this position of influence for the sake of others. Take Daniel, for instance. His initiative and agency ends up saving the Babylonian dream interpreters, who Nebuchadnezzar otherwise would have had put to death for not having the answer to his dream. And at the end of the chapter, Daniel advocates for the promotion of his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, Daniel uses his agency and influence for the good of others. What a great challenge for us today. How can we use the agency and influence we have in the world for the good of others? What would it look like to step out of the reality of our constraints and take risks that would benefit those who are more vulnerable than us or who face even more constraints in life than we do? What might this look like in your life? Where and how is God asking you to lean into opportunities to use whatever skills you have or whatever positions you find yourself in to work for justice, compassion, and hope in a world that is deeply broken?